Warning. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Guru Sang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Scott Belk. Scott is the Director of Jazz Studies at the University of Cincinnati's Conservatory of Music. Scott is a versatile player who is as comfortable in his role with the trumpet ensemble Trumba Monday as he is playing lead with Bootsy Collins. Scott is also the slightly twisted mind behind Lip Slur World Headquarters and has written two books, Modern Lip Flexibilities for Brass and Progressive Lip Flexibilities for Brass, which have frustrated brass players from around the world. So pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. All right, welcome to this episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang. I am your host, Jose Johnson, and here I am joined today with the one and only Scott Belk. Scott, what's shaking, buddy? Uh, not too much. I'm just uh, trying to remain... Uh... Uh, dry. It's raining like crazy here in Cincinnati. So I'm down in the basement where hopefully there's no leaks. Oh man. Yeah. I know it's been like some crazy thunderstorms going on around here too. So uh, uh, are you actually uh, in the uh, Lipsler world headquarters? Is that where you're located? I'm in the today? bunker. Yeah. I'm in the Lipsler world headquarters, uh, subterranean bunker. Uh, we're down mm -hmm. here where all the magic happens. Uh, you know, the production facilities and the, uh, um, the shipping platform is just over up. I have two like kind of spaces down here and I have a little desk that I just do nothing but uh, put together the, the, the uh, mailers and, you know, so dedicated spaces. But this is, yeah, this is Lips Little World Headquarters. Uh, it, it looks like a wonderful place to be. And uh, it, so uh, my question to you is. How in the world did you come up with that concept to begin? And not like lip slurs, I know where that came from, but but the whole idea behind uh, lip, slur, lip slur world headquarters. It's hard to say, especially after tequila, uh, but uh, you know the the idea and, and kind of the um, sort of tongue in cheek manner in which you present the information. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know the the tongue in cheek part is easy. That's just sort of how I I am. And, and a large part of just the way I go through my day is, is just trying to find some humor and ha have a good time. The, you know, the Lipsler World Headquarters thing happened, and, and I'm not sure when exactly we met what year, but uh, there were a couple of things that percolated for many years with what, uh, you know, uh, some ideas that I had. One of them was from the late 80s, um, I was taking lessons with a guy named Pat Harbison. I was living in Knoxville and I was coming up I was coming up to Cincinnati to to play in a in the a Dixieland band you know a traditional jazz band at, at uh, the theme park here at Kings Island and I started taking some lessons with Pat and somebody hit me to some Woody Shaw right around that time late 80s and kind of you know Woody, Woody Shaw is one of those people you have to deal with I mean you, yeah. you, whether you whether you you have to acknowledge there's there's something that happens and, and I just remember hearing him and thinking, wow, that's that's really something different, and, and there's something going on that I don't really get. And then right around that time, same same time was when Michael Brecker was really popular, and I was, and he had just put out his first record a year or two earlier, right around that time anyway. And I started thinking about, um, I started thinking about the concept of alternate fingerings on the instrument on the trumpet, and it just kind of, I didn't know what it, I didn't know what about it, but I said to Pat, uh, and he remembers this conversation. I said, well, it would be kind of cool if if somebody could put together a way of uh, uh, dealing with the trumpet that uses alternate fingerings in a harmonic way. So not, not like as an effect, but right. as, as an actual way of, of constructing lines or whatever, you know, I didn't really even know. I didn't really think that hardly about it, that hard about it at the time. And, uh, and then I kind of went away and I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything with that, that basic idea. And then in 2012, um, I was sitting on my back deck and I, I've still got a little video of it and it was summertime, summertime. And I was, I was, uh, just practicing. I practicing. I don't mind practicing in a practice mute and had my uh, iPad out and, and I was just warming up and I, I decided, you know, I had Sibelius out. So I was, I'm into Sibelius and I do all this typesetting engraving. I, I dig that. 
And I just thought, well, I'm going to write something. I played, I was improvising a little lip slur. It wasn't anything special. And, and I, I'm going to write this out. And I'm going to, um, I played it. I improvised it on the horn and then I played it and then I wrote it out and I said, I'll post it for my students on Facebook. You know, so this is in, in July. Yeah. And so I posted it for a couple of my students and I got, you know, four likes and, you know, and yeah. They're not even my students, so they didn't even notice it. You know, I tagged them in it, you know, and, and when you do something like that at the time, you could, you could create a, uh, um, you know, I'd do a screenshot out of Sibelius and then create a JPEG, upload it, and then tag people as if they're in the exercise, you know. Right. I don't think, I don't, it doesn't let you do it quite the same way now. But anyway, uh, I did a couple of those. And nobody was really thinking about it. And Lipsler World Headquarters, you know, wasn't, wasn't a thing yet. And uh, I came up with a good one, like a different one. You know, so, you know, the, if you're familiar with a book or the books, you, yeah. which you are, you know, they're, they're different. You know, there's, there's something that was kind of, I found something I was playing. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And I thought, okay, well, I got something here. This is a little bit, this is fun and it's a little different. And, and so uh, I put it into, into Sibelius and I thought, well, you know, because this is different, I want to do something a little bit different with it. And so, I put a little sarcastic, you know, uh, shtick, you know, greetings from Lipsler World Headquarters, you know, and 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 um, w- weather is beautiful out, la la la. The staff has been up all night um, working on this Lipsler for you, or something, something like that. I don't know yeah. exactly what the first one was. And uh, so when I did that, I, I I posted it to Facebook, and then I tagged fifty trumpet players, like Vince DiMartino and. Phil McCann and you know, cornet soloist, famous cornet soloist in, in England. And just like uh, Byron Stripling, cats that I knew that I worked with, but that were high level people. And I, ta- I tagged a bunch of my friends and other professors. And, and just, I thought, this is a good one. I just, what the heck, what will happen? And then I got, I think it was like, I don't know, 200 comments and, you know, over 200 likes or something right around that number. I, you know, I don't remember the exact numbers. And I thought, man, I'm onto something. I've got an audience. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then I sort of took it seriously. And I thought, oh, I've never really, you know, I said, you know, this is like the closest thing I've been to being viral since I worked on cruise ships, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Any case. Yeah. Uh, so that was cool. And, um, you know, I started to realize I, I, I wanted to kind of get this stuff out. And having an audience allowed me to think of uh, – of writing more on a timeline. I want to put one out once a week or, you know, and start a, a little bit of a, uh, a groove going with that. And I started to do it and I started to get more and more people engaged around, around the, around the world because of that social media, you know? So I started getting friend requests from the second horn in the Tuscany symphony orchestra or cats in the concert cabal, you know, brass section or, people from Spain and Africa, you name it. And, and just because they were seeing these funny exercises that were being posted. And then I started to get, uh, I started to get smaller publishers started to contact me, a couple of them, you know, two or three of them. And they were like, well, why are you giving this stuff away? And I, and, uh, I was like, well, I'm not giving it away. I'm going to, I'm doing pre publicity for the book. And so people yeah. would, they would, they would write to me and they'd be like, well, okay, uh, where I can't download the rest of the page. Well, there was no rest of the page. So I would take a screenshot of half a page. You remember this? Were you around yeah. for that? Yeah, right. yeah. 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 So I would like take a, a screenshot of half of the page and it cut off a line right in the middle. So it looked like there was more below it, but it would just be blank. <laughs> I don't finish complete false advertising, you know, marketing so, genius. Yeah. Yeah. So people would say, uh, you know, uh, where can I, I can't download, download the rest of the page. And I'd write it back and say, well, you're going to have to buy the book. Or, well, where do I buy the book? Well, it was not written yet. You know, so, uh, so as I was doing that, you know, uh, you know, I was getting a lot of feedback from friends and, and, you know, people that really were digging it. And, um, and I, I knew I wanted to self publish or I wanted to publish it, but I, I couldn't figure out how to do it because I've never published a book before. And this was going all through summer, July, August into the fall. And I was writing and I started, you know, my students at, at the conservatory. Um, they were seeing all this because I tagged them in everything and they were kind of, they were over it at this point. Right. So uh, at a certain point we had Terrence, Terrence Blanchard come over to the school and he was doing studio class for us, jazz trumpet studio class. 
And I don't know Terrence. I mean, I was just meeting him. He was in town to do a workshop uh, with his opera. And uh, so he came over and, and we were going to do a, a hang in my studio. And, um, and so Terrence sat down and I had a bunch of PDFs laying around from all these exercises I, I had done. And, uh, and Terrence was like, oh, man, you do these too? He said, I got these from Scotty Barnhart on the Basie Band. You know, do you know, you don't know who wrote these, do you? And I was like, you know, yeah, actually I do, you know. And, and my students were like, oh, man. <laughs> more lip slurs you know this is just you know um you know and and so as it as it, as it started to evolve and and get more a little bit more uh, um i don't want to say notoriety but whatever you know people started to know about these yeah. these exercises i started you know hearing from you know french horn players and uh that were that were doing the stuff and a lot of a lot of i mean orchestral players uh not just jazz uh, jazz musicians they're not put out as jazz jazz exercises per se and I went through the whole, um, whole fall, just kind of as I'm teaching my, you know, my regular job, but I, I also, um, you know, was kept, kept writing this and would do shtick and funny, uh, you know, this one was written after a late night jazz gig. This one was written after, you know, some uh, political event. This was how, you know, I would try to try, try to do fun commentary. And uh, finally, a friend of mine, uh, do you know Ben Huntoon? Have you ever run into Ben? Uh, um, no, I don't think so. Anyway, Ben is a great trumpet player up in Columbus, Ohio, about 100 miles from here, and, and we we go back. and And his day job is working at Stanton's Music. Oh uh, yeah, um, I know Stanton's. Yeah, so Stanton's is so he's like the jazz and brass guy there, and he's a trumpet player. We played a million gigs together. At the time, his son-in-law was in the um, one of the service bands outside of D.C. Uh, in the Langley band, and they came home for uh, for Christmas break. And Ben said to his son-in-law, he's like, hey, you, you should see these. I got to show you something. I got these exercises that a friend of mine has been doing. And his son-in-law said, oh, uh, yeah, all the cats in D.C., the D.C. bands are already doing these things. Everybody knows about this stuff, you know. So when Ben heard that and he, 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 he had connections with uh, some folks at Hal Leonard, which is the largest music distributor in the world. Right. And he arranged for me to meet with some people at one of the conferences. And, which I did, and I took a draft with me. It was at the NTC, actually, I think it was maybe um, in the spring. So I had worked out a, a contract, and, and, and then it, it, it took almost exactly a year for, from when I started the first post to when, when the book was published by Hal Leonard, and then it was distributed globally, and then that really took off. So uh, I ended up having to go backwards and go back into my Facebook messages and contact all the people that were interested in the book and say, Hey, it exists now, you know, uh -huh. you, can buy it, you know, and I, I tried to send it to Stanton, you know, give them links for Stanton's to buy it there. Or, you know, if it was an international, you know, they, it was carried on Amazon all over, you know, in Asia and, and Europe. And, and so, uh, um, but the, the weird thing about it is, is I really, you know, I didn't have any, uh, I didn't really have any interaction with the people that bought the book because it was, I mean, people come up to me and say, oh, I love your book or, I, you know, my students use your book or whatever. Uh, but they never bought it from me. So I didn't know they had it. Right. You know, so, um, you know, so when I did the second book, which, you know, there was basically, I guess, seven years in between them. I kept writing, but I just stopped posting. Mm -hmm. Stopped posting. And so when I had a sabbatical in 18, the spring of 18, I just, I sat around and, and started transcribing all of the material that I had written. Cause it cause what happened was I'd be practicing and I would, I start to improvise these exercises. And then, uh, then once I do it, I'd have to write it and put it in the Sibelius and shed it and get it typeset. And, and the whole process would take like an hour. Right. And I'd post and I'd tag everybody and it would derail my practicing. Mm -hmm. So I, I stopped doing that. I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I create like, a, I started creating, songs in um like garage band and i would just record i would just record a, an exercise or a slur or whatever like that into a, a track and just save it that way right. and i had them and then they would save to a cloud you know and everything like that i had them backed up automatically and i had just hundreds of them <laughs> i've got three more books worth of stuff but i'm kind of tired of it so uh, yeah you'll have to find a new thing uh, i'm not sure what it's going to be but uh yeah. I don't know. I think one thing, I, I, one thing is more than I, I would have hoped for. So, uh, 
you know, the, the pressure to, to be innovative or to try to be innovative uh, for the sake of innovation is, is, is kind of difficult. You know, it, it, it's, if you go out there trying to reinvent things um, that don't need to be reinvented or that other people do better. Mm -hmm. um, really what I was looking at was just like, well, doing this particular skill, um, you know, is there's gotta be a different way to do it. And now other people have done it. I'm not like the first person to combine uh, partials or whatever like that, but put that with a little bit of humor and put that with um, well, odd meters. But, but I tried to make them fun to play. Right. And that's the other thing. A lot of people, when they write, they'll write at the keyboard or they'll write um, academically. And so what I'd like to do when I, when I come up with exercises or technical types of things or, or whatever things I'm going to practice for myself, I want them to feel right. I want them to feel like a trumpet should right. feel. And I think that's something that's lost. When, uh, you, you look at someone like, um, like a composer like Eric Morales, you yeah. know, Eric, who mm -hmm. does all the, quint uh, the quintet stuff or the trumpet ensemble stuff. One of the reasons I think people like to play music by him uh, is that he writes like a trumpet player. Mm -hmm. So when you're playing his music, it feels right on the horn. And um, that's different than writing it on a, on a piano or on a keyboard or whatever like right. that. Yeah. And, and then, you know, you, you're following the natural, the natural way that the horn is divided and you can explore the possibilities of the instrument itself. And that, I think that's something that hasn't been done as much, you yeah. know, for its own sake. Uh, Alan Vizzuti did a lot of that, does a lot of that, yeah. you know, in cascades. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that makes you know, perfect sense because, uh, you know, when you're when you're practicing out of a out of a theory, you know, a, a, a traditional book, let's say um, Clark's or, or Arvin's or anything like that. Um, the ability to take some of those fundamental training exercises and apply them musically uh, without sounding like super square is is not there. Uh, so doing things that are, that are set up to work your your technical skills but to do it in a musical way because i mean the bottom bottom line is that's what we're trying to do we're trying to make music so you know it, it makes it a little more seamless so uh yeah i think you did a great job with the book and i i know i've practiced out of it it hasn't done shit for me but uh, i know i know it certainly helped a lot of other people so yeah well no you know and and, and i i write write to people or people write me write to me and when i uh, you know send me an email or a message and I said, just remember, you know, I, I didn't write the, I didn't write the, the book to make me sound better. I wrote it to, to make you sound worse, you know, and, and so far I, I'm, I'm pretty good. And, and it's, a, it's one of my favorite things is, is when, you know, like a good player that either I know or that I'm just meeting for the first time. Uh, uh, when the first book came out, the, uh, I don't know if you know Chad Shoopman. Yeah. Um, but Chad, I don't, I'd met him at a conference, maybe two minutes in the hallway. And, and he had actually heard me play a, a gig. Um, and I didn't know he was even at, you know, so, so I didn't know he knew me better than he knew me that well. Anyway, I'm sitting in my office one day, it's like five o'clock and, and, it, you know, just no one's around and my phone rings, it's Chad. And he sort of introduces himself and he said, yeah, you know, I got your book and I've been working out of the book. And I, he, he's like, he said, I gotta tell you, you suck. <laughs> I can't <laughs> shit. This, you know, and I'm, and I'm sitting in my, I'm like talking to him. This is the first time I've ever talked to him, you know? And I'm like, right. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's fun that he would take, you know, he would take the time to, to call me and just say, you know, this is identifying, you know, something that I need to work on and it, it, um, it's helping, you know, yeah. and I've had a number of things, you know, like Chuck Lazarus, if you know, Chuck, yeah. uh, in the Minnesota orchestra, you know, we, uh, same deal. We, we know each other a little bit and he'll send me a, he sent me some pretty funny texts that were, I can't really even repeat them. Uh, you know, they're just like, I'm working on your stuff. And then it's just him just flipping off the screen of his iPad yeah. you know, or whatever like that, you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, so yeah, well, there you go. well, you, you've accomplished your goal. You frustrated numerous trumpet players around the world. So yeah, well, <laughs> if I can only share what I can, what I know best, I guess. Yes. Yeah, well, so, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure there there are lots of uh, spouses of of trumpet players that would like to get their hands around your necks as well. So, yeah, I, you know, they're they're like starting with mine. You know, um, you know, I uh, my my wife uh, she doesn't play anymore, but she's a spectacular French horn player for many years in orchestra. And um, I would write something and I'd take it up to her. I remember one time she was practicing and I I said, hey, tre you know, check this new exercise I have out. This is maybe six or seven years ago. And within five minutes, she put her horn down and went and walked the dog <laughs> just like, ah, 
was like, I thought you would like that. I thought that would be him. She's like, yeah, done. I, I <laughs> ended her, ended her uh, practice uh, by doing that. And, and, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you think about it because uh, one, some of the, one of the instructions that we always get, you know, we all have teachers that are, if you made it to a certain point, you've had, had at least one good teacher probably along the way, hopefully not everybody, but um, you tend to get decent um, information or the similar information. And, and some of that is, you know, one of those things we hear is, is you know, you're going to play some technical studies, you're going to play exercises. You need to play them like they're music or you need to play them as musically as possible. But the, the problem with that is, is that certain things are so square and so rigid in the way that they're written and they're so uh, mechanical that there's only so much you can do musically with them. You know, right. a chromatic scale, Clark one, there's only so much you can do with something like that. At a certain point, you have to take that skill and you have to start to move it around and make it, put it into different contexts and different movements and stuff like that. So when I write, um, like say if I'm working on chromatic stuff, if I'm going to write uh, things that I practice, I'm going to look at how I can combine other skills with chromaticism as opposed to, well, I'm just going to write from here to there, back to here to there, back, you know, and, and so, so what ends up happening with, with people when they write technical studies is they tend to write some version of a Clark study, uh, but they change the notes, you know, and we're okay. used to, as trumpet players, we're used to, we're used to tr uh, working in circles, which is mm -hmm. great, it's small bits over small range around, and, and, and that, those, those, those repetitions are built in with the repeats. And I, de I definitely think of that when I, when I write, because I want my whatever I'm writing to come back on itself so that it comes back to the beginning and I can continue doing repetitions in a, in a way that's, you know, I don't have to think about it, you know, and they have a motor rhythm or they have something that, that's moving it along that sounds, sounds interesting. But, uh, but, you know, you can only do so much of that stuff, you know, and, and most, I think most people, once they get good, still continue to do too much of that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know? Um, it's like what, and so like, I, I was just talking to somebody yesterday, I was doing a lesson online and, you know, if it, if you're talking about some kind of fundamental, like it, it might be pedal tones or, uh, long tones or, um, uh, slurs or, or whatever you want, you know, the, the question is, once you get to a certain point, what, you know, what's the minimal amount I can do of this and still get, you know, the, the benefit. So if, if I used to do when I, in 1991 or whatever, I had a, a lesson with Arturo, you know, and I just found him on, called him and I showed up at his school up and I was getting off a cruise ship and he was relatively new in the States at that time. And he did his, uh, his pedal tone routine. It was just me and him in a room and I was just going, you know, yeah, yeah, there's nothing like it. Right. You know? Yeah. And so I thought, well, I'm going to learn to do pedal tones. And so for the next two years, you know, I spent like this inordinate amount of time every day, you know, doing this pedal tone routine and it didn't help me play music. It made my chops feel like ama amazing, but I, I didn't need to be doing 35 minutes of pedal tones. Right. You know, so I think we tend to, to get into these kind of ruts or, or grooves where we'll, something will be helpful, but we'll overdo it. We just do too much of it. You know, yeah. it's like, it's like uh, when, when athletes start realized that i mean there used to be you know we're the same generation you know but there was sort of a thing uh in the in the 70s and 80s with, with a lot of athletes that they didn't want to do weights because they thought it would um hurt their ability to do their sport right know? and what they realized of course is that's not true it's, you have to do it in a way that complements what right. you're doing and so what ends up happening for a lot of lot, a lot of trauma players is that the what amounts to the weight room, all the technical studies, all the methods that they do, uh, that's, that takes over more of, of, of their practice than actual music. Right. You know? Right. And uh, because you don't have to think about that stuff as much. It's easier to practice technical studies than it is to practice music because, you know, you don't have to think about that. And, yeah. and so, you know, when you're looking at the, you know, I think about my audience or the people that I'm working with and, my graduate students, whatever it is, like, I'm thinking about that time from, you know, the age of 26 until the age of uh, 66, you know, what are you going to, how are you really going to keep getting good? Um, not just maintaining um, the necessary skills to be a professional. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. You know? Yeah. I was actually uh, right before this interview, I was uh, actually teaching a lesson, but it was a martial arts lesson and we were having discussion about 
uh, practicing or training without practicing your form. You know, how do you do that? And I'm a big proponent of that. And I was explaining how you have, uh, when you're first learning anything, uh, it's a conscious process. You have to think about what you're doing, you know, what comes next, you know, what valves do I push uh, un until it becomes habitual. When it becomes ingrained in your subconscious, it's, it's a habit. And so your body knows how to do it better than your mind does. But what happens with most people is they get to that point where it's subconscious and they just keep doing it that way. And you never get any better because you just keep doing it the way you know it. So you have to transition so that you're doing something else that's conscious. So whether it's doing something like lip slurs where you're working on something mechanically, but then having to be uh, focused on how you are performing it musically, how your timing is, how your intonation, any of those, those sort of things, by changing that, you allow your, your subconscious to still keep processing what, what it knows, but to keep your conscious mind involved. So uh, yeah, I, th I think that's a brilliant strategy for for training, uh, you know, as a trumpet player that you've laid out. And I think the fun factor is important too, because man, there's nothing that sucks worse than just sitting in a practice room, just doing long tones and lip slurs and, you know, not having any fun with it. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, we, we get into this uh, concept of flow and flow is, is a necessary state, a flow state or a flow right. exercise mm -hmm. or whatever. And it, and, and, uh, and so you wind up trying to, uh, you know, we, we, we want to get to that place where we're in a flow state. But the problem with the flow state is, is that, uh, is that you're not, you're not, uh, the flow state by definition is whatever activity you're doing, you have mastered enough that you can flow with it. So, um, so that the level of your ability and the level of what you're asking yourself to do, the, the level of what you're asking your abilities to do is below that or at it. So it's easy. Uh, flow is easy because you have mastered or you, you're at that level. So that's not how you get better. That's how you meditate. And that's how you, you reinforce the skills that you already have. But for you to actually uh, to get out of that is where the, what you're demanding of your playing mechanism and of your, of your mind is to be slightly above what you're asking, what your ability is every yeah. day that you're trying to get a little bit, you know, you're, you're pushing or asking more of the, of your ability than you have at the moment. Now, if you can get into that learning state, which is, uh, it's related to like deep work. Have you seen mm -hmm. the calendar report stuff, the deep work, right. uh, the idea of, of conscious difficult work that requires, um, a f solving a, a proof, a mathematical proof or, uh, working with a, a really a complex code or dealing in a symbolic language like music or okay. learning a physical skill like trumpet. So uh, something that, is, that, that requires uh, more of your uh, concentration, that, um, that kind of deep work by definition is difficult. Right. And if you can't flow in that in the same way that we can do a flow study. Flow study is easy, I got this, I don't have to do that. So, but you can flow, you can build flow on different levels. So flow is an intu can become an intuitive way of problem solving. Mm -hmm. So as if we're sitting in like what professionals do, like great, great professionals do when they're practicing is that even though the, they're learning difficult material that, that they have to get better to play, the process is flow. They know how to get into that state to do the deep work that makes them right. uh, get, uh, makes them better at, you know, efficiently. And, and there's flow in that. It's a different level of flow though. Mm -hmm. And, and so the problem is, is that what a lot of people are trying to do in their practices is that, you know, if their level is here, they're asking this and it's too much. So the frustration comes from failing too greatly, right? It's not from failing. It's from failing, not even close. And, yeah. and so, you know, you can look at like a, a model, like uh, Kenny Werner's effort, effortless mastery um, where he's talking about um, a practice diamond. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. That, yeah. You know? and, and on the bottom three, points he has um uh speed and then it's sort of antithesis accuracy and then down here is the length of the passage so these are all like inverse proportions the, the longer passage you play the slower it's got to go and the accuracy is going to go down right the faster you go accuracy goes down unless the passage is short enough right so you've got right. these kind of uh, there are uh, variables in, mm -hmm. in the moment of what you're practicing and, and how you practice it. And this is, goes to anything that you're doing. It's knowledge work or, or technique or whatever. Right. But at the top of the diamond, 
um, he has the concept of effortlessness. And that is where, for me as a trumpet player, that's that flow state of I'm not going to push my physical limits past where things are uh, out of balance. Mm -hmm. So if I get to that point, I know to back off it or to rest or to play with less intensity or with more support. And so you're, you, this is the one thing that doesn't, uh, the, the idea of effortlessness is the one thing that doesn't, it's not a variable. It's yeah. a constant or the, it's, it's non-negotiable. When you get to the point that you have enough chops, enough physicality and enough, to, uh, enough knowledge to, to, to get to that next level. Um, and you know, what is it? Uh, John Hanger, Hagstrom said, you, you know, that uh, like relaxation is a, a byproduct of strength. Right. You know, so you can't relax if you're not strong enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yep. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a dynamic balance. And yeah, I would say it's a yin yang kind of thing where, um, you know, for something to be effortless or to appear effortless, it's because you put in the effort, you front loaded the effort. You know, you, you've, you've developed the, the skills, the mechanism, the foundation to be able to do things. And then it's just getting out of your own damn way and allowing things to be able to happen. And then that allows you to shift your cognitive resources towards the things that need to be addressed at that moment. So instead of worrying about how how do I do this, it's it's how do I want to do this? How do I want to express this? Exactly. So, no, that's That's exactly the language that I use, you know. And to do that, what people don't really realize is that it, you have to get the the technical part of what you're doing down so that it's no big deal. And it's not an event any longer. It's just something you do. And what ends up happening with a lot of, especially young players who don't have a lot of uh, playing opportunities is that, you know, maybe they're playing two concerts a semester and then a board exam um, and no gigs. And so yeah. when they go into this board exam, I mean, it's like the biggest thing they've done. You know, it's, it's 40% of their, you know, uh, performance for that semester. And, and therefore it's, it's going to be a, a big event and, and you're trying to hope to play the hope that you play well. And you don't want to be in that position. You, you need to be in like, well, I just want to play like I usually do. You know, I want to play, well, I usually play. Okay. Wow. It's really, really thundering here. I don't know if you could hear that. I, I, I wasn't sure whether it was that or the skyline chili that you had for lunch. I don't know, man. I thought the dog fell off the mantle. <laughs> or something. Like, I don't know what was going on upstairs, but uh, that was, that was thunder. So I got kids. So, yeah. but uh, they're, uh, they're hanging out. I think they're watching a movie. So. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's really true. I mean, you, you the, and the more you do it, and of course, this, with the, this COVID situation, that's just made life just miserable for so many of us that, uh, you know, that opportunity to be out there and to be on the stage and or to be in the studio or doing whatever it is that you do, uh, as those opportunities get diminished, then, uh, you know, you find yourself losing your edge sometimes because, uh, you know, there's a big difference between psychologically between being in the practice room and being on the stage. And uh, ideally, that shouldn't be the case. It should be the same across the board. But but there is something about uh, the adrenaline that comes comes into play and and uh, the dynamics of when you're you're working with other individuals and, and how you, you approach the music from that standpoint. So, um, yeah, opportunity is, is such a uh, I think an uh, underappreciated factor in our abilities. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the other thing about it, though, is, is you know, there, there, there's so many different ways to look at, 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 at a situation and, and how you frame it um, mentally, as you know, is, mm -hmm. is really the, how you, how you're, the qualitative experience that you're going to take away from it is going to be from how you're able to frame events and frame situations. And so I think about, you know, when all this started happening, um, you know, the people that I've seen that have been successful, that have been able to navigate at least artistically and and from a musical standpoint, navigate this the best are the ones that have already have a really solid uh, routine of uh, and a regimen and an organized approach. If you went into a you went into lockdown and you didn't have any kind of organization or any kind of groove going before that, then people really struggle. It's even because now the, the time is the structure of the rest of the day is even. So you don't uh, like for students. A lot of times, and I, I, I speak for myself, you know, when I was a student, the reason I got stuff done was because I had to get it done by a particular deadline, right. you know, and I, you know, I didn't enjoy it, though. I didn't enjoy practicing when I was in, you know, an undergraduate in college. I thought it was very, 
it, it was difficult for me and uh, the results were so inconsistent that I didn't, um, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't feel like a lot of times that I was, you know, I didn't look forward to it, let's put it that way. But the, uh, um, you know, but for me, I, you know, I think about someone like Sonny Rollins, who took a, essentially took a sabbatical and spent, I can't remember how long it was, six months, or I, I'd be talking out of turn if I knew how long it was, and basically did turn down gigs, didn't do anything, and went under one of the bridges in New York, Brooklyn Bridge or something like that, I can't remember what bridge it was, and, and just spent nights practicing. And he took a self-imposed, uh, you know, sort of break to, and he, he said, now I got to get my stuff together. Well, you know, that's like a, this was like sort of a, a romantic uh, fantasy of some of what we would have wanted to do ourselves if we had the time to do it. So, you know, I say to my students at the end of the year, you know how busy you just have been for the last, you know, nine months and how you wish you had time to practice, how you wish you had time to do all this stuff. Well, here you go. It's the first day of, of summer break and, and uh, you've got that time. Your wish has come true. All right. But we're not, we're not wired that way. We don't go, right. oh, finally, I've got this time that I've, I wish I would have done anything for if I had had, you know, to, to have this time. And, you know, you read some, you know, you can read some, um, uh, what is it, Seneca on the shortness of life, or you can read yeah. the, uh, any of the, um, uh, the Stoic philosophers or anything like that. And, you know, a large part of, of the, the, the daily life that, you know, you get out of Stoic living, or, you know, is, is from the, the, uh, the time you have to yourself, your time, right. you mm -hmm. have control over. Well, we go into this uh, lockdown and we suddenly have these huge amounts of time. And, and they're, they're, these are possibly the, the, like the greatest gift you'll ever get in terms of time in your life. In right. any of our time. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, like I said, if, if for, for people that don't know how to handle day to day in a regular life, they, they, it's, it's, it's overload in terms of time. But for those, some of us, for me, it's been one of the, one of the most uh, um, amazing uh, experiences to just, okay, now I don't have to worry about gigs. I don't have to worry about, you know, for long stretches of time. And now I sit down and I still have, if I don't know what I'm going to practice, I've got enough, I've got an automatic pilot. It's like mm -hmm. doing forms or doing whatever you're going to do in martial arts. You've got a, a routine that you go through every day. And then what I can do is consciously or unconsciously or intuitively go off the rails and go and be creative with my practice or with, with, with my, uh, uh, with my time and see what happens with it and, and intentionally just pick something that I wasn't planning on doing and do it, you know, and, yeah. and follow it and then enjoy it. It's like one of the most enjoyable things you can do. But uh, I think that the reason, uh, you know, I have enough of an infrastructure family wise and with enough stability that we're not worried about, you know, you know, we're fortunate enough. We're not worrying about making rent or, yeah. you know, covering those things. So for people who are in that situation, it's a different conversation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, lots of them, you know, and, uh, but, uh, you know, my wife has, a, she works in healthcare. So, so suddenly she, her, you know, her value went up, right? you know, and, and uh, she works in skilled nursing, you know, so, which is where, you know, this is where a lot of the, the pandemic has hit, hit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm able to say, well, even though I don't have, uh, you know, any freelance, like any of us uh, income, I do have book income, which has mm -hmm. also been quite nice. You know, I just shipped off four books today. You know, and that's, that's a little happy hour gig right there, yeah. you know, you know, or a, yeah. a, you know, a, a Tuesday night gig that I just made. Um, but the, you know, being able to think in, in the terms of, you know, um, how can I frame this sudden gift of time and, and, and use it and not squander it, you know, and I, I wouldn't, I would be lying if I said I was totally, uh, you know, uh, nailing every day with sets and sets of, of, of uh, uh, organized, structured, you know, activities, but I do have a lot of things to do and I, I tend to get to them, you know, yeah. um, but I, it's nice to have a little pace. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have talked to a, a number of friends the, about that same thing. I, I was uh, having a kind of a conversation with uh, uh, Seraphin Aguilar uh, out in LA and he was talking about that of, of uh, how you know the demands of what he's usually doing, uh, which is you know kind of pounding out those lead gigs, those Latin gigs. It's like you know, I spend all my practice time trying to just keep my chops up to be able to play those gigs, and now I don't have any of those gigs, so I can actually practice things that 
I don't normally do. So, uh, you know, it's, it's that mindset of being able to take the situation and, and make the most of it to make it work for you. So that's cool. Well, yeah. You know, if you've got a, if you've got a project or you have something that you've been wanting to do that, you know, and for some people it's maybe a, it's trying, for me, it's been doing some stuff with equipment. So one of the things that I did was uh, it became obvious, you know, right around the beginning of April that I was going to have some time before I had to worry about working. And, and, and so uh, there were a couple of things I said, well, all right, I've been bouncing around between setups, you know, different setups that I use. And I want to, you know, I want to really devote my time to a specific uh, uh, setup of equipment that I really like the sound of. And then um, that I feel is very easy for me to play, but, um, but it has some squirreliness to it. So, all right, I'm going to figure out how I can use this equipment and get it to where I'm going to commit to using smaller equipment. And I've just, I've been doing it for what, how many months now? And yeah. I've taken something that I, you know, that I didn't like the sound of at first. And I spent time building the sound quality of it and the resonance of it. And I'm still doing it. But it's been very gratifying because it's it's making some things that I've you know been struggling with for years suddenly not suddenly but gradually easier, you know. And I've got problem solving skills because I've been doing this a long time, like right. like you know. So a lot of people don't have the patience to understand that they're going to just have to go through these frustrating things, these things that are you know you're going to want to jump off a bridge because you're you can't do simple things the second day in a row or whatever like that. Right. And, it's everybody. You're going to pick up, I still pick up my horn and I, I go to play and I go, Oh man, <laughs> I've been playing for 40 years and I, I sound like dog shit, you know? And it's yeah. like, uh, you know, and here we go. All right. Well, yeah. we're gonna get past that because it's not the first time. And, um, you know, looking at, looking at what we do and just say, all right, yeah, it's not such a big deal. We'll be fine. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that's, that's the thing. It's, uh, I was actually having a conversation with my wife uh, the other day, which, you know, once again, we find another parallel. Uh, my wife's a nurse as well. And, um, you know, we're having the conversation about, you know, uh, having to uh, reinvent yourself. Uh, you know, it's something that I've had to do a few times and, you know, uh, break things down, put them back together. And I said, you know, the, the difference between me and a lot of other people is that I've just done it enough in my life, sometimes by choice, sometimes <laughs> not by choice, but I've had to basically rebuild the way I played, my career, everything about me. I've had to rebuild at some point multiple times in my life. So it's a process. And I know, hey, if I did it this time, eh, I could probably do it you know, again, and you, know, you, you learn the skills of how to go about it, how to do the problem solving, how to, to create the structures. So um, I think that's, that's a critical skill that, yeah, I wish more people were teaching in the collegiate, or actually just in general, that people were, were teaching that to uh, musicians, uh, you know, that, uh, yeah, there's, because there's so many natural players out there uh, I use that term loosely. I hate the word natural, but that people are able to do things uh, without a whole lot of direction, but then they eventually will hit the wall and then they have no idea how to fix the problem. So, you know, it's developing those problem solving skills. I think it's critical. Well, I mean, you've got what ends up happening. And when you see that enough, you know, I use the example of, oh, it's the kid in eighth grade that gets a Maynard Ferguson record and goes, Oh, all right. Grabs his horn, starts playing along with Maynard. And is the, you know, by the time he's, a, you know, a junior in, in high school can play double whatever and uh, play along with Maynard to all that kind of playing and didn't ever think about it. Didn't ever have to think about it. And their teacher or, you know, people that know them along the way, if they meet a professional say, Hey man, you need to get together a routine and you need to get together, you know, make sure you got good fundamentals. You're taking care of business. Um, and uh, all of those guys hit a wall, just like exactly what you're saying. I haven't seen anybody that hasn't, hasn't, you know, and now I'm sure that maybe there is, you know, that someone's just a natural, wonderful player and they can just intuitively do it. But everybody that I've run into that I've talked to has, has always, they've always hit a spot where that doesn't work anymore or they get a little older and, and they don't know, you know, something goes wrong or they had a long stretch where they get injured or something like that. And they keep, they've not been paying attention to how they do it, but they haven't had to pay attention. 
And, um, and so we look at it, those of us who had to really work at it a whole way, I didn't have those natural chops when I was coming up. So I had to figure out how to do it later in, in my late twenties and into my thirties um, to, you know, from the lead standpoint, but the uh, you know, but there's no reason for those folks to, if it always works, why would you spend all this time doing other stuff? It doesn't make any sense. And people, they're going to get this great information. Yeah, you got to study how you play because it's going to break. And you're going to have to fix it. And my wife got that. She was that person as a French horn player. She was a natural player. And her teacher said, you got to learn how you play. You got to learn. You got to study it. You got to look in the mirror. You got to take notes. You got to figure out how to, how, to, how to fix it. And she was like, yeah, whatever. And then she went on to grad school. And one of these teachers changed, some, changed an embouchure that she didn't need an embouchure change yeah, and it messed her up. And then, mm -hmm. so she left that school and she found herself, you know, back in, you know, back in her hometown, uh, getting calls for gigs and like, Oh no, you know, this is, I got to fix this. I got to figure it out, you know? And, yeah. and but she wasn't going to listen to that advice, um, because she didn't have to, she, mm -hmm. she just had this beautiful, natural, beautiful sound. And, uh, I guess you can't fault that. I guess you can't, yeah. uh, the, re the rest of us, you know, if you're in, you're in, uh, you know, you're in, in the, in the martial arts or you're, where you're, you're looking at, at something where it is, if you knew, if you just had a, an idea that you could do whatever it was that you needed to do without having to practice it just naturally, I mean, it would be difficult to make yourself do a bunch of things you didn't think you need. Right. You know, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think sometimes it, it boils down to, um, asking the right questions. And when people ask me like, you know, for anything, whether it's, uh, you know, music, martial arts, uh, personal development, anything like that, and they ask me, you know, what's the best way to do something? And I say, well, you know, the first question I have to ask you is what is it you're trying to do? Because the, the best way to approach uh, getting result A is gonna be the worst thing you could possibly do to achieve result B. So ask yourself, what is it you're trying to, to gain? Or what is it about your current situation that you either don't like or you would like to see some level of improvement on? Is it your tone? Is it your tonguing? Is it your flexibility? So uh, you know, think about those deeper questions. You know, Why do you wanna change and what exactly do you wanna see that change look like? Uh, and then you can start to logically uh, look at what steps you need to take and what you need to address to, to get to that point. But I think most people just don't even bother uh, asking those kind of questions. It's just, you know, I want to be better. I want to play higher. You know, it's... Yeah. Well, that's philosophy. I mean, that's, that's asking questions, yeah. you know, that, you know, that's seeking wisdom as opposed to trying to get, and, and when you look online and, and you see all the trumpet players and, you know, that are giving tips and tricks and hacks and things that you go, here's a, here's in four minutes, I'm going to give you, you know, something and, and what you end up. And, and a lot of the information, not bad information necessarily. There's, there might be kernels of truth to all of them, but a lot of, a lot of folks are looking at that and they're thinking, Oh, well, you know, if I just do this one thing that this one person said, you know, in a five minute or a four minute, you know, video that I'm going to, there's going to be some kind of shortcut that's involved. And uh, it's all of those fixes. It's like it's like the uh, gadgets you get for golf, uh, whatever, like that. You know, you can it's something that you. Sorry, I'm gonna, shoes coming off. Um, you 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 see these these uh, instructional videos for golfers, and they've got this thing that does this and helps your swing. And this you put on the on the club, and this you put underneath your elbow, and you know you strap this to your waist. And and probably all of them are you know when you use them for instructional purposes are able to illustrate a point. Right able to show you something that maybe you can be aware of or you can work on, uh, but none of them have any lasting effect because they just create a momentary awareness of some mm -hmm. aspect of what you're doing and they don't change. They don't, they don't do the necessary reinforcement to change it or to improve the situation. Or maybe that's not something that was even a problem before. Right. You know, that's not really the problem. You know? So yeah. it's all self-diagnosis really. I mean, everybody yeah. teaches themselves yeah 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 they say yeah your own your own best teacher so but, uh, yeah that too so uh, speaking of uh of teaching uh you're at uh cincinnati uh conservatory of music at the university of cincinnati spent some time in in uh, my hometown of columbus for a while 
Um, yeah, because we've had that discussion about some of the the cats like uh, Vaughn Weister and, and those guys. I met my wife in Vaughn's band. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was back in the day. Back in yeah, the day. We yeah, awesome. Years, yeah. Awesome. So, and you went to North Texas, right? I for, did my master's great. there. I did yeah. my doctor here actually at at, at CCM, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I was in North Texas in the in the mid uh, mid nineties doing my master's. There. Yeah. Who else was in the uh, the one o'clock with you? Well, Scott Engelbright, mm-hmm. um, Scooter, um, Jamie Dauber. Do um, you know Jamie? You would know Jamie, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah up around. Now, where are you physically right now at the moment? I'm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, Jamie, um, there. The at that point, um, Ari Honig, drummer. Um, he's uh, done amazing things. Most of that group, you know, I was in it for two years and, and most of that group went, a lot of them went on to be in like the Airmen of Note and in uh, Jazz uh, Ambassadors and the Army Blues. There was a point where I think the, um, the Airmen of Note was well over 50% North Texas guys, you know, from, from you know, so around the time that I was, I was there. Um, Alan Baylock was around in those days and he's mm-hmm. the director of the one o'clock now, you know, and so he, we were playing his charts when he was a student and they were amazing back then. It was before he went on to the airman and note and um, Adolfo Ad- Acosta was around Donnie mm-hmm. Dias. Uh, I mean, there were so many great players at that, in that scene, you know, and, and uh, but it was a, uh, I was a classical trumpet major, you know, I, I wanted to have a degree in classical because I didn't think a jazz de- master's degree was going to be, helpful to my career uh, at that point. I think I was kind of right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my degrees are in classical tr- trumpet, but 90% of what I do is, is either jazz or commercial. Mm-hmm. So, and that was, yeah. So that was, I got out of there in 95, 25 years. Wow. Yeah. So many great guys that have come through that, that school. It's amazing. It was intense. I mean, it's a little, I mean, I, I know it's different because of the personalities that are in leadership positions down there and it's much more chill in a good way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was not a, uh, a, what I would call would be a life affirming uh, uh, type of uh, environment for me. I was older. I was an older married uh, graduate student and I found it to be very, very intense back then, uh, and in those days. And I would say I was pretty well adjusted and I, there were just times where it was just overwhelming. And, uh, but it was interesting because that was one of those situations where when I was talking about, you know, your ability being here and you're asking this much, it felt every day that, that, that was what, that what I was being asked to do was so far beyond my capabilities that, uh, I wasn't going to get through. So, so it was a very, when, when you have something like that, and then it feels like everybody around you is, is so much better than you, mm-hmm. you know? only because that's true, <laughs> you know, it was like, it really felt like all the guys in this section and Jamie and all those, they were much better players than I was. And I, I, in retrospect, I can say the only reason that was is because it was true, you know, and, <laughs> and, you know, and the, the, uh, the, the, the trombone section was amazing. And, you know, these, everybody would stand up and play these amazing solos. And, and it was just like being, it was, it was, it was, it was like an adrenaline rush out of fear and uh, like the first concert we did when I was in the one o'clock, it was, it was hilarious. Uh, you, you're, you're, you can't breathe because you're so nervous, right? You know, and, and it's, uh, it was in the, what they used to have this uh, student union, the Rock Bottom Lounge, the RBL. And I'm not tall. You, uh, I'm, you know, five, six or whatever like that. And I could reach up and touch the seal. All right. You know, it Ow. was like that kind of a place. And this is the one o'clock. And then you have 500 jazz majors all there. And you're getting ready to play for these. And it's crazy, right? You know, and, and I couldn't breathe, you know, I could, I was just like, I don't know. And, and this was like the second week of classes, right? So the first week was drum auditions. So we'd had like two, two rehearsals and then we played two set, two or three sets and none of the music we had rehearsed. Oh man. It was all sight reading, right? So it was all sight reading. And, um, and, and Neil Slater, who was just, one of the most intimidating, he was hilarious, but he was just dark and just like, man, it sounds like shit. <laughs> play better. And we'd be like, okay, you know, and you play better. Um, so he looks at the band and, and I, and he says, uh, 
you know, this is, it's time for you to show why you guys are this band. And they're not. <laughs> and then he calls up corner pocket and I'm like, and I got the solo and I'm like, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, I was like, I got, you know, I'm going to on corner pocket. I'm going to show why I'm in the one o'clock and, and these guys who are every bit as good. I was just older, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, it's like, I, that was not, not a, not a great uh, swinging environment. You know? And uh, so, but that whole culture down there is a certain, there's a certain way of doing things and it's changed somewhat um, over the years. And it's, it's really mellowed. You know, Alan is a great teacher and uh, writer and he can get just as much or more out of a band now mm-hmm. than, you know, um, than when I was in the band uh, without having to use that. And you couldn't even use those kind of tactics now. Sort of like whiplash, whiplash basically. Um, yeah. You know, when that movie came out, there were, you know, a bunch of people on Facebook with friends of mine that we were all in school together. Does that look like, does that remind you of anybody? You know? <laughs> Yeah, maybe. So did, did, did that experience uh, shape the way that you approach uh, your position uh, at, uh, at the conservatory? Oh, yeah, really, it really did. You know, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, being at a place like North Texas, because the culture is so, I mean, there are a lot of people get out of there. there there's basically three levels of, of attitude towards the place when they get out of North Texas. So people that hate it, that just thought it was just the worst experience of their lives. Everybody was a jerk. Uh, the music sucked or whatever. I mean, there's just, there's, there, there, you know, and I'm not saying they're sour grapes. They just didn't have a good experience with it. There are people, there are very few people that were ambivalent about it. They just kind of thought, well, it was, you know, good for that or not so good for that. And there are other people that were just like the most amazing place I've ever been to. And you have really strong polarities with a, with a place like that because the environment was so, um, it was so intense. And I, I don't think in a bad way necessarily, it just depends on your disposition for some people horrible for me. It really made me up, up my game. But, uh, but I also realized that I didn't want to, I didn't want to have a community uh, in my school to feel like that, mm-hmm. you know? And I, I think it's counterproductive, especially at a small, I'm not a small school by any stretch of the imagination. It's one of the larger colleges. Um, you know, we've got 1400 students in the conservatory. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, but um, you know, we don't have the depth of, of students. So like our best students um, would be at, perfectly at home anywhere at, at North Texas or, you know, the schools in, in New York and, and, uh, or Eastman or whatever like that. And many of them, you know, go to those other schools. Um, but you know, if you, if you look at somebody and they're not cutting it, you just kick them out of the band because they can't play the shout chorus. Um, there's not a necessarily, you know, five guys just as good that we can bring into that, into that situation. And, you know, whereas in, you know, in, in uh, North Texas, there was, you know, I was in the hallway one time and, and there was a, one of the guys in the band who was, didn't want to do a gig uh, from the, for the one o'clock. And, and he was talking to Neil and he said, yeah, Neil, I, I don't want to do that dance. And it was a paying dance, you know, or something like that. And, and, and Neil's like, well, no, we need to do it. It's a fundraiser for the, you know, for the program. And, and the guy was pushing it and he said, yeah, I, I you know, I, I just really don't want to do it. And so finally, you know, you know, Neil was like, yeah, I'll just give me your book, you know, and he gave him his book and, and we never saw him again. He was out of the band. You know, yeah. and he didn't say you're out of the band. He just yeah. was. You know? and, and so like that, so sometimes you, you wind up with some people that a lot of people, generations of people that left Denton and tried to do things like that at their small school, their small, uh, you know, liberal arts college in Iowa or their whatever, you know, and that, that way of teaching doesn't work. It's like, right. it's like being a coach at Alabama versus being, you know, a coach in division three, you know, intramurals, you know, or something like that, you know, where yeah. you have, you have to, you have to nurture your students. You have to be able to create an environment that they can thrive in. Uh, and you can't have that pressure. So what happens when you have somebody shows up late a little bit, but they're really great. And, uh, and you want to make the allowance for them, but you don't want to set a, a precedent, you know, you're going to kick them out. What are you going to do? And we have to straddle those, those lines, you know, yeah. all the time. Yeah. And um, it's not cut and dried as, as, as if, if we wish it was, you know, we could say you're, you're late. You know, in the real world, you'd be fired, you know, which is true. But this is not the real world. It's school. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and when you when you look at that, you know, and um, I was listening to a talk by somebody, a lecture, and he was talking about how the American schools are um, 
he had come over as an immigrant or his parents had immigrated after World War II. And he was talking to another friend. They did, they'd come from East, uh, Eastern Europe. And uh, he said, the schools over here in the United States are, are not so great. And he says, well, what makes you say that? He said, well, he said in the schools that, uh, and this is in the, from the fifties, he said at, at university, he said, I can, if I show up five minutes late to class, I'm going to get, all hell breaks loose. They're going to, they're, they're angry at me. They're, you know, I get, I get a tardy, I get whatever, you know, uh, but if I get a C, nobody says anything. So, yeah. you know, we look at the professionalism part as necessary and it really is, it's really valuable. And uh, you have to have good work ethic and professionalism, but um, the it's not because we're factory workers. Um, we have to be able to do professional work. But the really important part is, is you know, is somebody getting a C? That's not, a, you know, that should be a bigger thing than somebody that can't show up on time in in an artistic way. Yeah. So when we look at things from that point of view, then we start to think a little differently about how we interact and how we want it. And I think about those things when I direct my band as well. So like, so we might be doing a, an Ellington concert or a repertory concert, a Mingus concert, or, a, you know, all different types of things that we, you know, we'll do, you know, specialized repertoire. And I'm never wanting to try to cop the record. I'm not trying to make our performance sound like the record. Um, I understand the value in, in, in doing that and it's, but it's not something I want to listen to. Yeah. So when I'm in front of my band, the beauty of it is, is I've got a good enough band, um, is that artistically I can think, what would I like to hear? What would I like to hear if I were the listener? And then I can ask my band to do that. And if my, if I've informed my listening and my aesthetics, then hopefully it'll be a, a good product, but I know at least one person is going to like it. <laughs> it's me. It's me. <laughs> right you know it's all about you it's always all about you scott why is that you know what that's <laughs> you know it's it's uh that you, that's where i think the vision comes from when you're thinking about our uh you know when you're in front of an ensemble you know are you trying to to create something that sounds like something that's already been done or are you trying to have your own take on it when you were talking about it, we were just talking about it you know it's not how do we how do we want to play it, you know? How do we want to play it? When we were when I was down in North Texas, it was a very harsh harsh way of playing. It was very uh, studio. It was like actually an exaggerated way of playing, right? You know. Yeah. So so you you know the the, the phrasing and and all that was very uh, it, it tended to be overdone in that environment. Now, did it translate to session work and to sh commercial show work and all kinds of stuff? Yes, absolutely. So there's, there's much to be said for that way of playing. But that, uh, you know, at a certain point, it stops, to sw stops swinging. And the feel of the music comes from, similarly, the ability to relax while you do it. And if you don't have that air of relaxation, you're not going to, you know, underlying, you know, the technique. Yeah. It's very difficult to swing. And um, for it to feel organic and, and, you know, it can be exciting and it can be full of energy, but uh, the natural, what I want to feel when I listen to a band or what I want to feel when I listen to my band has to have some breathability and some lightness to it. Dennis McCrell, the great drummer talked about playing lightly enough to swing hard, you know, and, yeah. you know, and it's easier to do that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It's well, physically easier to do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, there's there's so many things I would love to talk with you about, but um, I'm going to switch over to our last part of the interview, which is where I'm going to ask you some very pointed questions. It's a speed round, so we're going to get through these really, really quick. So I didn't get these in advance. Wait a minute, I didn't know about this thing. Yes, this this is this is your exam. So take a nice big swig of coffee. We're going to be all over the place on this. Oh no! All right, here's your first question. Who's the biggest influence in your life that is not a trumpet player? Wow. Um, the, uh, at, at present? Sure. My family. Okay. What's your favorite book? I don't have a favorite book. I, I like to read, but I don't have one favorite book. Not Lip Flexibilities? 
No, no. In fact, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't actually own a copy of my first book. <laughs> no, um, you know, whatever I'm reading now is usually my, my, my favorite book, you know, hopefully. Um, so I have a, a broad range of, of stuff that I, I, I like and from uh, his, history to um, right now I'm reading uh, Noam Chomsky's Understanding Power. Uh, it's not my favorite book. But nothing jumps out of me as the number one book, you know. Okay, well, I'll send you a copy of my book, and then you can say that it's your favorite book then. All right. Okay. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Oh, I can think of the worst children's book. It's The Fire Cat. <laughs> Pickles the Fire Cat. It's really that bad. Um, the worst movie? I, I don't know. Man. I didn't know we were going to go off topic quite like that. I, 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 don't, I can't come up with any, anyone right off the oh, top. Oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? I'd be a writer. Yeah. What's your favorite drink? Uh, coffee. Drink it every day. Yeah. You could have a, you're going to have a dinner party, and you can invite any three living people to this party. Who would they be? Uh, any three people that I can, I, that I can, um, uh, that are living. Any living people. Um, just some friends, you know, Steve Ali, who just, who just retired. He's fun to hang out with. Um, my, my two friends across the street. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you could invite any three dead people, any three people from history. Um, wow. Let's see. Socrates would have to be one of them, of course. He's uh, he's uh, one of my favorites. The um, who else? Um, there's there's a lot of cats. I'm not I'm not you know. The the good thing about you know, if you read if you read somebody, if they're a really great writer, um, you feel like you know them. Right. <laughs> You know, so are they going to be, are they, when they come to dinner, are they going to be uh, uh, adhering to modern day uh, hygiene and, uh, uh, you know? Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, let's see. Um, They'll be wearing masks. Yeah, right. I mean, the whole thing, they, they, you know, they didn't have, uh, they didn't have deodorant back in the Middle Ages or anything like that, you know? So um, I, I try to, I would try to think of people that would be interested. I like to, I like to have dinner with uh, Christopher Hitchens. He's one of my favorites, um, and I think he would be fantastic. And another dead person. Um, let's see. Um, drawing a blank. It wouldn't be Joseph Stalin, I can tell you that much. Um, who would you have? What are your answers to these questions? Hey, this, I, I'm asking the questions here. Uh, I, what you're finding out is I'm pretty limited, and I'm not, I'm not that interesting. <laughs> not that interesting once we start getting out of my domain. That's the problem. Uh, see, that's that's, that's the, the question. That's we want the, to keep moving. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, lacquer plated or raw? Raw. Okay. What's your favorite quote? My favorite quote. Um, uh, there's a there's a woman for every man, but the ice man has his pick. Oh. Man, you could only have one superpower. What would it be? Um, you mean other than the ones that I already have? You're saying exactly. Or I, have to, or I have to give up some of the ones that I have to yes, only get right. the one. Is yes. That what it yes. One superpower. It would be to uh, to ease suffering. Hmm. Okay. Uh, as opposed to what you're doing with your books, which is to increase yeah, suffering. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I got. The, I've already got the stick. I need the carrot. Hey, there you go. Uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? Um, power, or the size of somebody's sound. That that is, uh, uh, people are looking at having a huge sound. I think that's uh, um, highly overrated. Okay. You can have a beautiful sound, or you know something that you know, but size of the sound is, yeah. Size doesn't matter is what you're saying. Not when it comes to sound. Okay. Uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you think is the most underrated? Soft playing. Okay. You can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Um, 
that's a, th those kind of questions are are hard because uh, I like where I am now, and if I if I go back and try to help myself out, I'd probably screw it up, and uh, you know, like those time machine yep, things. Exactly. So, so I would, uh, you know, I would I would just leave myself alone. I'd let myself do what I was going to do. You make your own mistakes. You need to make them for yourself. So, yeah, I'm good. Okay. Uh, same vein, you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice about life. Yeah. No, I'd, same deal. I've, you know, I've, I've, I've been fortunate. I've had, uh, um, I feel like I've been fortunate in my outlook and how I've been able to deal with things and uh, the support that I've had around me from my family and my friends. So um, I, don't, I, didn't, I don't think there was some missing ingredient that would have somehow changed the outcome. I, I like to think that I'm sitting here in, 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 in my present situation um, and it's a good situation and uh, anything else is, you know, this is what my life what it was going to be uh, no matter what. So that's, I'm, I'm good with that. I don't need any extra advice. Very good. All right. Final question. What do you want your legacy to be? Um, I'd like my legacy to be, um, you know, I think it, it's interesting to think about that because I think maybe my legacy in a way is sort of uh, out there a little bit that I was able to look at something um, you know, from a creative way, in a creative way that was fun and have a, a novel spin on something that, um, was appreciated by people that do who do what I do. So, um, you know, the, the big joy of doing a book where I've gotten that kind of feedback from my, uh, the domain of trumpet players and brass players is, um, is satisfying in and of itself at this point in my life. So anything beyond that, um, is not really any, uh, uh, a legacy is something that tends to be there after you've already gone, and I'm not going to really be worrying about that. But the the current legacy of of what I've done is when I, the reason we're talking is because I wrote a book, you know, and and you dig it, I guess, you know, and and I, I get I, I run into these people that that with social media, which is so great, is that you've got um, suddenly people can just kind of find you. Uh, I spent time last week working with a guy who's uh, in Poland. Uh, who's a uh, principal trumpet player in one of their Philharmonics. I don't even know what city. And he just contacted me out of the blue and, and he said, I'm having these problems. And I, I said, well, try this and this and this and this. And, and we kind of went back and forth and it wasn't a lesson. I didn't charge him anything, you know, and, and, and he sent me some, you know, uh, videos of him doing the stuff. And he said, this is really helping me, you know? And so, uh, and that was really cool. So the, the idea, I think of like someone like Vince DiMartino and his legacy is that, that you know, people came in, in, in contact with him and they, they were inspired and they got better. And, uh, and he was a cool dude to be around, you know, I'd like to, like to be sort of like thought of that way, but you know, if, you know, you won't be thought of much longer after you're gone. So <laughs> I'll have a book at least around in, in the rubble of the aftermath. Right. Yeah. <laughs> They'll make a movie out of it with Denzel Washington. Of course. Right. I mean, people will often mistake us. Yeah. You know? The book so, of Belk. The so. book of Belk. Yeah, I know, man. No, it's fun. You know, it's, just, it's, it's, you know, writing and, and being creative is, is it's, you know, you got to stick around and try to get good at it, at least good enough that you can appreciate having fun doing it. That's a lot of people who just quit doing things before they ever get good. Yeah. You know? you know? yeah. It's more fun to be good. <laughs> all right yeah that's true that's true when i get good i'll let you know all right well scott i really appreciate you taking time out of your day to be with me and uh this has been really uh an enjoyable conversation for me and uh, you know we've we've had our hangs before but i think we really got uh, got a lot deeper than than we normally would have uh, but i really enjoyed it and i hope that uh all of you who've joined us on this hang will uh, come away with some some words of wisdom from uh, Mr. Bell because he's he's got a lot going on. So, Scott, thanks once again, my friend, and uh, looking it's forward. Great to hang with you. Yeah, and look looking forward to doing it in person. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But just make sure you keep Tartel away from me. So uh, yeah, he's everywhere. I can. Yeah, I know. But uh, yeah, it's been great. So uh, best wishes in all that you do. And for those of you who have joined us, as always, peace and slide grease. We are out. Hey, thank you so much for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating connection through our mutual love for the trumpet life. 
I hope that you learned a few things about today's guest and had some laughs along the way. Don't forget to give us a review. We love those five-star ratings. And please share this podcast with your friends. We want to see our hang grow for show. Have a suggestion for a future topic or a guest? Hit me up at thetrumpetgurus at gmail.com. Our opening theme was written and performed by Lexi Signor, and all other music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. So in the words of W.C. Handy, life is like a trumpet. If you don't put anything into it, you don't get anything out. So go out there and let your trumpet sound. And I'll see you at the next hang.